this episode continues the story that we were trying to tell in the last occasion it's about the different stages of the non cooperation movement the non cooperation as we all know had two distinct dimensions at one level the movement had something to do with the way the congress leadership was planning one of the most important movements against imperialism against the backdrop of the khilafat wrong and the punjab wrong in gandhi's language on the other hand this was also an occasion when many local grievances which were directed against the agencies of oppression institutions of oppression which were not necessarily british which were also indian the oppression by the land owners oppression by the mill owners so the laboring classes were actually uh, restive around that time because of price rise because of wage cuts their grievances were directed naturally against the mill owners whereas the peasants for some time at least in certain regions been participating in movements on their own initiative and these movements began to converge with the non cooperation a movement which otherwise aimed at bringing about the unity of different classes minimizing occasions where conflicts among classes in the indigenous society would weaken the thrust of the movement so the point that needs to be borne in mind at this very early part of the discussion is that the congress priorities and the manner or the reasons for which the local population often participated in the movements unleashed by the congress were not always identical there were differences in the same way one can actually see remarkable regional differences in the articulation of the movement the movement was strong in certain areas weak in other regions among within a region you would come across some of the districts becoming more volatile than others the movement seen from the perspective of the all india congress leadership went through different phases so it is a very complex kind of an event where you have multiple subplots woven into this story you have differences regionally you have differences temporally shubhit sarkar has been able to stitch them together to provide us with a certain kind of comprehensive framework on which we can perhaps rely for understanding these complexities and divergences that we come across in the non cooperation movement as you know that the non cooperation resolution was passed in nagpur in the congress session and the congress was expected to swing into action from early part of january so between january and march we see a spectacular outburst of popular resentment even in bengal where the congress leadership particularly chitranjan das had not been in favor of the gandhian line of action succeeded in mobilizing the student community in such a way that for some days between january and march 1921 the students almost took over the streets of calcutta there was a massive student upsurge in calcutta but also in some of the major district towns as well this was also the phase when responding to gandhi's call people were renouncing their titles some of the people were leaving their government jobs motilal nehru and chitranjan das to cite the two most prominent examples gave up their legal practice the gandhian reconstruction program was also very successful during this early phase when the gandhian workers were moving around the countryside spreading the message of sadesi and charka perhaps to build bridges with the ordinary masses and the peasants so the first three months of 1921 saw the movement in its upswing particularly the students were uh, a very important catalyst to the kind of massive upsurge that we had seen during this period 
it was not as if that all the people in India welcomed this kind of changes. If you look at Calcutta, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, the famous Vice Chancellor of Calcutta University, was not at all very happy with the way the students were boycotting classes, were boycotting examinations. In fact, a famous cartoonist, Gaurendranath Tagore, actually published cartoons in which the boycott itself was very indirectly criticized. So there were people who were not actually endorsing the idea of this kind of boycott of educational institutions by the students. But boycott of educational institutions featured as one of the main items in the non-cooperation agenda alongside renunciation of titles or severance of links with the government. In the second phase, which can be traced from around April, you can see signs of dissipation. It's quite normal, you know. It is not always possible for a movement to retain the steam. So once the signs of dissipation became evident, the Congress leadership began to concentrate more on what in modern parlance would be called party building, creating an organization so that this organization would be able to carry the mantle of the leadership, at least in the local levels during the course of the movement. The different classes of people actually supported the Congress or supported the movement. Once the signs of dissipation actually came, the emphasis was naturally on organization building and one of the critical events of this phase was the initiative to create what is known as the Tilak Saraj Fund. The idea was to mobilize financial resources for the Congress to uh, sustain their agitational activities, organizational activities. On June 30th, the AICC met at Bombay. And the emphasis now came to be placed on boycott of foreign goods. Bonfires were taking place where foreign goods were burnt. And many businessmen, in fact, refused to import foreign textiles. At times it is suggested that because of an adverse exchange ratio, when the rupee was declining in value in relation to pound sterling, the businessmen were required to pay more for what they were importing. So some people argue that that might have been the consideration for the business people to stop importing foreign textiles. It was not because of any difference that they felt towards the idea of boycott of foreign goods. But it seems that it is a very narrow kind of an explanation. One may perhaps link it with the larger consideration that these business groups had about the protectionist demands of the Congress. As you know, the impact of business support was such that after a while, Lord Reading, the Viceroy, wrote to Montego that there was need for the government to devise measures to conciliate the business classes. Many historians who have worked on the relationship between businessmen and the Congress actually suggests this thesis that as a consequence of the kind of support that the businessmen were giving to non-cooperation, the government also began to change its position so that the government was willing, the government was agreeable to the imposition of excise duties, import duties on the imported products in an attempt to assuage and conciliate the business classes by providing a certain kind of protection measure to the Indian textile industry. So that by 1930, we see a situation where the business classes were no longer so forthcoming with their support to the Congress as they were in 1921. There was a time in 1921 when the Congress vision of a unitarian movement came very close to uh, being achieved in a sense that 
you have all these different classes of people who are coming together in a movement. And, uh, these different classes included businessmen, tribal peasantry, peasantry, laboring men. But I was actually telling you in the very early part of the discussion that during most movements when local grievances often find a certain means of expression. So as we move away from the third phase, when the boycott of foreign goods became so important, we come to the fourth phase. Sometime around November, when the Prince of Wales was expected to visit India, the Congress actually planned massive protest against the arrival of Prince of Wales. And Gandhi said that there should be massive protest against it, often running the risk of flooding the prisons. And the arrival of Prince of Wales in India had led to violent clashes in Bombay, where he landed, but also in other major cities as well. And that marked the beginning of the fourth more militant phase, say from November to uh, February 1922. On the 11th of February, the movement was withdrawn. And this militancy was to a, some extent generated initially by the Khilafatists who had become angry with the arrest of Ali brothers, who had already been angry about the kind of treatment that the imperial powers had meted out to the Caliph. So the Khilafatists took the necessary initiative to inject a greater amount of militancy to the movement. And at that stage, Gandhi was preparing for a more elaborate kind of an agitation asking the peasants to refuse payment of taxes. And this movement was to be undertaken and carried out in one of the Gandhian strongholds in India and in Gujarat, in Bardoli, where the peasants were asked to stop payment of taxes. Roughly around the time when this resolution was adopted and the movement was on the cars, the incident at Chauri Chaura took place near Gorakhpur, another very important stronghold for the Gandhian organization, peasant organization, where the peasants went berserk, killed a number of policemen. And that was the occasion when Gandhi decided to suspend the non-cooperation movement, which invited lots of criticism from some of his own followers. People who were expected that Saraj would come in a year became disillusioned by the manner in which Gandhi decided to withdraw the movement. So we'll come to this later. We'll have something to say about the way Gandhi's perception about Gandhi among the common people did not always tally with the way the Congress leaders actually looked upon Gandhi as their supreme leader. For example, the ordinary people had a sense of Gandhi being a god, Gandhi being a Maharaj, Gandhi being a kind of a messiah who is able to give the people a certain kind of strength on which basis they would be able to ward off even the bullets. So you have different impressions of Gandhi to which we turn later. But the point is that such incidents like Chauri Chaura at least actually demonstrate before us the problem that was inherent in the Gandhian mobilization. The logic of Gandhian nationalism, as you said, was to unleash a movement against imperialism, but it had to be a controlled mass movement, a mass movement that was not likely to widen the class conflicts in a society, which would allow the coming together of different classes despite their differences and antagonisms. It called for creation of alternative institutions, alternative sources of industrial goods like textiles. We know that the national education scheme didn't succeed. Most people, people who left their colleges and opted for some national institutions ultimately had to return to the colleges once the movement actually was called off. You have some glorious national institutions during this period which were formed as a part of this experiment. You have Jamia Melia, which was initially set up at Aligarh and then it was moved to Delhi. You have Kashi Vidyapit. You have a large number of national schools also 
which enable students dropping out from the government schools to join the national schools. But most of these national schools were short-lived. Then once again, the same problem recurs. Until the time when Indian mills began to produce on a large scale for the market, dependence on foreign goods was inevitable. So it was not always possible for the Congress leadership to practice what Gandhi was actually visualizing for them. There were inherent tensions between labor and Melonis. You know that it had happened in Ahmedabad and later in Bombay, a strong labor union movement began to grow under the leadership of men like Sripad Dange, to cite just one example, who has joined politics as one of the non-cooperation volunteers. But later on, he moved towards Marxism and started comparing Gandhi with Lenin by arguing that Lenin had a, a greater emancipatory message to offer for the laboring classes. Similar divergences also existed in the peasant movement. As you know that there were many instances of how peasant militancy was deliberately contained by breaks imposed on peasant mobilization by the Congress. So these problems remained endemic in the national movement and this was also one reason for which the movement was ultimately withdrawn. Sir, if the Congress had actually planned the movement so elaborately, then how did such an incident take place which forced Gandhi to withdraw the movement? This movement was an occasion when you see the convergence of local factors with some of the broader program announced from the higher echelons of the Congress leadership. You have so many local factors and which is the reason why it was not always possible for the Congress to keep control over these regional movements. These regional movements had many participants. You have the Akalis in the Punjab, you have the Moplas in Malabar, you have the laboring men at Chathpur in Bengal who are protesting against the oppression of the local steamship company. You have the tribal population in certain parts of Bengal in Andhra region. So all these different people, the peasants in northern India, in Bihar, in United Provinces and in Gujarat, some of these areas which had always been Gandhian strongholds. So such different people came to participate in the movement for different reasons. I hope that you can follow the argument that there are occasions when the announcement of a broader political program from the higher echelons of the leadership would provide opportunities for the local people to come together and participate in the movement. Sir, I wanted to ask how far was the support of the Akalis motivated by the concerns that Congress had? Akalis were certainly drawn into this movement. But the Akalis were drawn into this movement largely because of their concern to establish control over the shrines. Since the British were not allowing the Akalis control over these shrines, the Akalis found that the non-cooperation idea was worth pursuing. So when those demands were subsequently met, the kind of intensity in the participation of the Akalis in 1921 that we see naturally began to decline. So let us take, for example, another important event taking place in southern India. The non-cooperation was an occasion when the Moplas, spurred on by the Khilafatists, began to participate in a massive uprising against the imperial state. But the Mopla uprising had a long history, as you know. It goes back to the middle of the 19th century and between 1836, when the first Mopla uprising took place and 1921, you had as many as 90 rebellions, big or small. So in 1921, it acquired a massive proportion because of the Khilafatist campaign in the region, which managed to draw in the Mopla peasantry of Malabar, the Muslim peasantry, local Muslim peasantry, as they were known as Moplas, into the non-cooperation movement. So there was always this possibility 
of a movement which converged with the non-cooperation because of the influence of the Khilafatis and then drifting away from the main objectives of the movement by espousing causes which had nothing to do with the fight against imperialism. Mapla rebellion of 1921 is a case in point which after a stage acquired communal overtones even though in the initial stage the participation of the Maplas was a part of that Khilafatist non-cooperation uh, combination. Apart from Kerala, where the Mapla movement gave some strength to the non-cooperation, as you move to the Tamil country, you see that the representative of the lower caste, the Justice Party, were, was willing to participate in the council election. They did. Even though the scale of voting was low, the Congress was looked upon as the agent of the North Indian Brahmin elite and the Justice Party claimed that they were representing the original Tamil settlers. So you have in Tamil Nadu where the non-cooperation movement actually generated labor strikes, generated some amount of uh, popular involvement in mass movement, but there were other factors as well, other tendencies as well of the kind that you see in the Justice Party participating in the council election, taking a position against the Congress. But as you go up and come to Andhra, you see suddenly the province comes into prominence as a major center of agitation, particularly coastal Andhra, on which much has been written about people, the literate people, the intelligentsia participating in the movement on a grand scale. But within Andhra, apart from the intelligentsia who were certainly expected to participate in the non-cooperation movement as a part of the and Congress leadership as a part of the nationalist leadership, you have the Gudem Rampa uprising. This is the tribal movement in the hilly region of Andhra. So similar tribal movements also took place in Bengal. For example, in Jargram region, in West Midnapur region, you have tribals participating in the non-cooperation movement under the leadership of Bhadralok leadership. Congress leaders succeeded in mobilizing the peasants in the region. But they had their age-old grievances against forest laws, against the way their access to forest had been undermined by the imperial forest laws. Similar things happened at Kumayun as well, where there had been an ongoing movement led by a man called Badridat Pandey against the kind of forest laws which had deprived the forest people, the tribal people of their usual access to forest resources. So you have such kinds of tribal mobilization as well during the non-cooperation movement. But the heart of the movement certainly was in northern India among the peasants in Bihar, in United Provinces and in Gujarat. These were the three Gandhian strongholds. As you know that Gandhi had started his career in Indian politics from Gujarat with the Satyagraha at Khera. But then you have a large group of followers of his who managed to inculcate these Gandhian principles adequately among the followers. But even there you have tribal barayas who did not wish to remain limited by these Gandhian prescriptions. You have in United Provinces an ongoing peasant movement from an earlier time. Then these peasant movement began to converge with the non-cooperation with local leaders like Gauri Sankar Misra, about whom we had said something in the last occasion when we talked about the background to the non-cooperation movement. But if you look at UP and Bihar, United Provinces and Bihar, and see the contrast, there also you see the complexities. In Bihar, the leadership was recruited largely from small landowners who didn't wish this movement to become very militant. In UP, the situation was different where the Congress organization could easily be activated against the powerful uh, landlord classes who were usually loyal to the empire since the middle of the 19th century. Ultimately, as we try to round up this discussion, uh, the discussion on non-cooperation, considering the very complexities, considering the varieties of factors that actually began to converge, we have to admit that this was one of the greatest happenings in uh, Indian history. The British felt that they were perhaps 
facing an onslaught that they had never seen after 1857. They were unnerved by the extent of this mobilization. At least for some time, the different levels of Congress leadership, including men who were not very happy with Gandhi's or was Gandhi's emergence as the leader of the Indian people, accepted his lead, swung into action. But one should always remember the fact that movements of this kind cannot be sustained after through a long period. Once the Congress movement was withdrawn, for which reason Gandhi had been severely criticized by left-wing historians who would always say that Congress had betrayed the masses after actually bringing them in into the movement. So these restraining uh, influence of the Congress is always is often looked upon as betrayal of the peasant cause or of the cause of the people by the Congress. But one should always consider the difficulties in bringing together different classes of people in a movement against colonial rule. The Congress's objective was not to start a social revolution. The Congress's objective was to win power from the British. So the perspective of a social revolutionary is not going to be very useful for understanding the difficulties of the nationalist leadership. And if you look at non-cooperation and see the massive scale of the kind of mobilization that Congress had been able to achieve, non-cooperation stands out as one of the momentous events. Congress did not sustain this for a long period and congressmen in many provinces returned to the constitutional mode of politics by expressing their willingness to enter the council. But in the conflict between nationalism and imperialism, there was no final solution. So that in 1930, when the same congressmen decided to start another movement, we are talking about the civil disobedience of the 1930s.